for me, I'm the New York City born um, person who came through the public school system with my mother being a, a school teacher and uh, a progressive. I went to a public school, an elementary school, and then the high school of music and art, which was one of the so-called fame schools. I went to Stuyvesant. So you went to Stuyvesant. We went to Seward, so. Yes. Uh, right. We hear you. <laughs> right. And which was euphoric in a way because it gave me a vision of what a really caring integrated community can be like. And of course it was the arts that precipitated right. that reality. And uh, there was so much acceptance of everybody, but everybody else, which was very uncharacteristic of the time in which we lived, because um, uh, our society at the time was very, very socially hierarchical. And uh, the, the, the ideas about what was to be the goal in life were rather uh, strange to me uh, in terms of what society said and echoing many of the realities of our own time now in 2013. Uh, it was about wealth, about uh, the power that money brings you, it was about um, uh, success as defined in, in terms of career, not in terms of the evolution of a human being who is caring and loving and thinking and... Uh, actualization. Uh, actualization being defined more as uh, success uh, in business, say, are you going to be successful? We want him to be successful, meaning we want him to have a career and her didn't exist very much at the time, but not in uh, the context of the high school music and art, where what was really valued was something intrinsic in, with, within the human beings. Again, that had to do with the fact that we were suffused in music and art and that that in and of itself creates a kind of sensitivity and a perspective that is uh, and liberating. Then I went on to Cornell and I studied, uh, started as a physics major and got my degree in experimental psychology. And I found it a Finish very... A physics major. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It, it was a very alien society. <laughs> yes. yeah. a bit, but that was true of all of those Ivy League colleges. It was a good education, but it was also a very good education in what, um, what I was going to be up against in terms of society's point of view as it was lived moment to moment there, right. where there was uh, uh, there's a real division in terms of um, who was considered in and out and the whole idea of the prevalence and dominance of the, of the fraternity system was, I think, annihilative to, to the spirit because uh, it, was, it was not about uh, issues of substance, the division, it was about uh, very superficial realities. How you, how, you, how you dressed, uh, how much money you had, whether you were Jewish, whether you were non-Jewish. When I got an undergraduate instructorship in folk music, as a senior, it was the only undergraduate, undergraduate instructorship that existed there, I, uh, I found the most remarkable uh, evolution of, of my own circumstance. Uh, I was singing for a large, in a large lecture hall for these p 
people that I was finding so alien. And they were, their hearts were open. And as soon as they were singing together, something brought them together and it became a magnet that attracted hundreds and hundreds of people to try to be there on Saturdays when we had a sing-in. I was teaching under the professor, Professor Harold Thompson. And I realized that within these very same people who were uh, living a point of view that I found uh, bizarre in some ways and certainly not loving, they had a lot of heart that was expressed once they had a vehicle for sharing it and the sharing of music in that circumstance at Cornell in an English class called English 355-356, popularly called Romp and Stomp, which was a gut course. So all the pre-meds took it. But it had a very clear message that within these people who I found so alien, there was a wonderful, wonderful capacity to respond to a different kind of call. And it was that that triggered my decision to not go into the world of uh, experimental psychology or uh, an allied field, but I went directly to Greenwich Village because I had the notion at the time that music was going to be um, an important part of an alteration in society. But when I was in college, I, um, I loved the Kingston Trio. I was, um, I, I wasn't a fan of the, the Kingston Trio themselves. We didn't have that uh, kind of phenomenon. We, we just really loved the music. I, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, was wonderful. And there was a kind of a wry, uh, exuberance about this uh, person who was condemned to death, which was uh, ironic and, uh, and characteristic in cer certain cases of folk music, where there's the combination of a celebration of an event, a history that somebody wanted to tell, but at the same time, the event itself is uh, is grisly, and uh, like the banks of the Ohio, which is a southern mountain murder ballad, and yet there is inherent in it this uh, wonderful duality of a circumstance that's somewhat. Um, uh, and, and, and troubling, um, and yet um, there's something wonderful about sharing that together. And and the Kingston Trio was not noted for singing songs that made you feel like crying. The songs may have, but their delivery was uh, all um, just the joy of singing together and being together, which uh, was a, a, a wonderful counterpart to me. Um, there was the, the Sloop John B, as, as I remember, that I thought was a terrific Again, in the soup chanby, I feel so break up. I want to bro broke up. I want to go home. So uh, there was there was definitely that influence. They were like a bunch of fraternity guys, but they were uh, not exclusive. They were open. They were joyous. They were welcoming, and singing the songs of the Kingston Trio at the time was not unlike people singing Beatles songs in a later era.
So they, uh, they really had an effect. They really um, gave people an idea that everybody can sing this music. You're, you're, they're not performing in such a way saying, look what I can do, I'm, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm Isaac Stern and look what I can do, or I'm Barbara Streisand and, you know. What, what they said is that ordinary human beings who l love this music or find it attractive can do something quite meaningful that will enrich them and enrich society simply by taking part in it. And that was a big gift uh, to me and to others. It uh, provided um, a confirmation that um, uh, that kind of sharing related to our experience and was liberating. And in a sense, the success of the Kingston Trio, which was enormous, made it clear that a group, a singing folk group, was a viable uh, entity in terms of the world of music that would accept such a form and there could be great success. Because that was the case with the Weavers, but their careers were eradicated by the blacklist. And uh, they had huge hits, you know, with uh, Irene Goodnight and Sena, Sena, Sena. But overnight, nobody would allow them to sing in any place but a summer camp or something like that. And such was the era of the blacklist of, of Joe McCarthy. Now, subsequent to that, to my knowledge, the first folk group that made it clear this possibility has arisen in Phil Bloom again was the Kingston Trio. And so it heralded within the music business the awareness and the respect for the possibility of that point of view. And subsequent to that came the Brothers Four, which was a manufactured group. It, uh, they, uh, Greenfields was not a real song. It, was, it didn't have any roots. It was a, a commercially devised something that echoed that perspective. But it didn't, uh, it didn't really um, have what I would consider the legitimacy of the Kingston Trio. The Kingston Trio, you know, uh, came along and shared something at a seminal moment that was very important. They, um, they were a bridge, as were Peter, Paul, and Mary later, between traditional music sung with almost a, uh, a mimicry of the traditional way in which the songs were sung, which for some people is being authentic. To me, it's no more authentic than singing as yourself. Uh, and, and it was understandable to the vast American public. And they embraced it. And then Peter, Paul, and Mary, in our own way, in our own style, followed suit. And uh, so there's a great similarity and bond between the work of the Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul, and Mary. The Kingston Trio meant that there was a kind of a joy of unanimity of spirit in the air that was expressed in music, that had the heart of traditional music and therefore a kind of authenticity rather than moon, spoon, june lyrics. And it meant that this kind of music could be front and center in the American pop music arena, even though it was very much unlike what had preceded it. Uh, the Kingston Trio uh, paved the way in many ways for Peter, Paul, and Mary, as did the Weavers, by reaching a broad national audience 
with a folk-based music and allowing people to enjoy the sense of unanimity, of closeness, when they were singing these songs. These were songs that anybody could sing. They did not profess to be uh, doing something that others couldn't do. So it was a people's music in their hands and in their voices. And that's very special. And they did some very important groundbreaking in that regard.